that it has recognized uh, 501c nonprofit recognition from the Internal Revenue Service. It was founded in 1946 by Colonel Samuel Engel Burr, Jr., who was a professor of education at American University in D.C. Um, in about 2004 or 2005, I became curious about who a woman was named Luella Mitchell Allen, who every year sent her dues checks in. But nobody knew her that I know of. No one knew who she was, and I don't think she had ever attended an annual meeting, to my knowledge. So, at that time, she was living in Arizona, and I think after her husband died, she moved back to the Germantown retirement home in Philadelphia. <clears throat> so, I, I think two things happened. I received a tip from one of our formerly active members named Dennis Lachlan, who owned a bookstore in York, Pennsylvania, that Luella Allen was a descendant of John Pierre Burr. I don't think I knew much about John Pierre Burr at that time. Um, I talked to Charles Bloxon of the Afro, I think it's called Afro-American Center at Temple University in Philly. And he confirmed her uh, descendant, see, from John Pierre Burr. I then contacted Luella Allen, who was about something like 88 years old. And I went up to her apartment in the retirement home in Germantown and met with her and her sister, who I think lived above her, uh, in a floor above her, and was blind. The sister was blind. And here is Luella. I'm sorry I don't have multiple copies of this. When I say that Luella was a um, wonderful, loving, um, gentle person, uh, I really mean it. She was delightful. She showed me her vast collection of books, chronicles, research, just boxes and boxes, which I think exist today in her family. She told me her oral history of how she was uh, a descendant of John Pierre Burr. Um, I then invited her, and I and the other officers of the Aaron Burr Association invited Luella to come and be the subject of our 2005 annual meeting. We have a meeting that lasts about six days every year. And the meeting was in King of Prussia at the Hilton, and she came to the meeting along with many of her relatives, Alan Ballard of SUNY, Albany, etc. And she laid out her uh, ancestry and delighted us with her presence and her presentation. So then we started researching the matter Luella, of course, was very happy and pleased to be recognized, and she died not too many years after that. I think she was in her early 90s when she died. Um, I remember seeing on her mantelpiece her, a photograph, a nice photograph of her sons. How many? Four of us. And, and here's Stephen raising his hand right here, one of her sons. And I, 
I seem to recognize you from that photograph. So, um, in other words, Luella had sent in her dues every year, and we finally knew who she was. Um, two articles came out that year, one by Valerie Russ of the Philadelphia Daily News, which is this article here, I think in the fall of 2005, and the other article in the Wall Street Journal by Gregory Ip, IP, who's a very prominent economics uh, reporter for the Wall Street Journal, who is Helena's, married into Helena's family. No, yes, yes. <laughs> so, the matter of Jean-Pierre Burr started getting uh, on a roll. Harry Anderson is our 98-year-old mega member living in Mystic, Connecticut now. And he started both researching and funding research into the uh, Jean-Pierre Burr um, lineage. And it took him several, many years. He hired someone, actually, named Kay Freeman. And documents were found in the archives and in the city records. Some were complete, some were not complete. For example, the death record, um, which I have a copy of, does not show who the mother or the father is of Jean-Pierre Burr. And also they misspell his last name as B-A-R-R. -R. But that happened quite a bit, that, that type of thing. So, Harry Anderson, funded, except for a $500 grant that we got from the Pennsylvania Abolitionist Society, thanks to Mark, Mark's Beaujolais raising his hand in the back, who, who tipped us off that we could apply to that society for a grant. Except for that $500 uh, funding source, Harry Anderson uh, funded this entire, this entire project. And we thank Harry a lot. He could not be here. He's in a walker, and um, he's in good shape, but we thank Harry. Um, I might add that Frank Burr drove Luella to the 2005 annual meeting, didn't you, Frank? And drove her back home afterward. Um, the whole subject of Aaron's two children, first the daughter in 1788, and then John Pierre Burr, born in 1792, has been um, a complicated subject. Um, I think our organization was a little bit resistant to it in the sense that um, Aaron was still married. So that's, you know, that's a little, that's ticklish. But not that this is any excuse, his wife happened to be dying of cancer, but that still doesn't make it any better. I mean, that you have a, have a rela relationship while married to someone else. But anyway, there were a number of um, things that slowed down our official recognition, which came at our annual meeting last year in Marstown, New Jersey, when um, the attendees of our group voted unanimously to recognize that uh, Aaron Burr was, was, is the father of Louisa Charlotte, the daughter, 1788, and of Jean-Pierre Burr, 1792, and Aaron's wife died in 1794. Um, Sherry, enter Sherry Burr, raising her hand over here in the reddish dress. Sherry attended our meeting last year for the first time, correct? And Sherry happens to be a powerhouse. She is, well, she's written 27 books, for one thing, for 
starters. And she is very organized, very dedicated, and very, very efficient. And um, she was voted by our group to be our third vice president and has been working tirelessly ever since to accomplish the creation in New Mexico of this uh, headstone that you're going to see in a minute. Should we, can we have the unveiling? I like the memorial poem by Ralph Waldo Anderson, Anderson, oh my God, Anderson, because it, it kind of captures what I believe is the life of John Pierre Burr and why we can consider him a success. This headstone um, honors him as a champion of justice, a conductor on the Underground Railroad, and the son of Vice President Aaron Burr. To the left of the headstone, you'll see a stairwell, a staircase, and you see his picture on top, and to the right is the, uh, a rose. And I chose this element from the book in New Mexico because as I researched the life of John Pierre Burr, I thought if anyone had done enough deeds benefiting humanity to deserve admission into the pearly gates, it was John Pierre Burr. So that's why we have the stairwell to heavens with his, his picture on top. John Pierre Burr could have, and his sister Louisa, could have passed into white society because their mother was East Indian, their father was English, but instead they chose to marry into the African American community. John Pierre's wife, Hester Elizabeth Emery, her father fought in the Revolutionary War. He fought in the 5th Pennsylvania Regiment. He re-enlisted nine times. And when um, George Washington rode north to take command of the Continental Army, he was so impressed by all the free blacks who had become part of the Continental Army that he wrote Congress to encourage them to um, allow them to en enlist. And I think they were the source of why he was the only president of the 12 of the 16 presidents who owned slaves, um, of the first 18 presidents who owned slaves. He was the only one to free all of his slaves in his will. And I think part of that had to do with his interactions with free blacks during the Revolutionary War. The provision in his will uh, said that he would have the slaves freed upon the death of his wife, Martha, but she felt that he had incentivized his slaves to do her early death so they could get their freedom. So she signed an emancipation deed to free them immediately. So they got freed within a year of his death. Um, and I think part of that was George Washington's interaction with free blacks like John Emery Byrd. If you were to look at a record of all the anti-slavery societies all the anti-slavery groups that were formed in Philadelphia between the end of the Revolutionary War and the beginning of the Civil War, you would find either the name of John Pierre Burr or the name of Hester Elizabeth Burr on every single role. They were so active. And most importantly, they opened their home to what I call self-liberating slaves. These were people who ran away. One of the stereotypes, and people like Thomas Jefferson even wrote this, that being a slave is wonderful because you get your housing provided, you get your clothing provided, you get your food provided. But what he didn't say was the housing was a dirt floor, the clothing was two linen items a year, and the food was barely enough to sustain a child, let alone grown adults. 
But there was this belief that being a slave had an advantage because you didn't have to worry about taking care of your needs. It's totally false. And so many ran away. And of course, you're familiar with the names of Harriet Tubman, who was known as Moses, um, uh, on the Underground Railroad, bringing people up. Um, through Philadelphia, John Pierre Burr was one of those conductors, and she was proud that she never lost a single passenger. And she was such a small lady, but she was so strong that there was one slave that she liberated who said he couldn't go any further because it beat her. And um, Harriet said, that's fine. She lined up all the other men, and she said, we have to shoot him. Uh, because we can't let him go back. He will reveal what we've done. So lined him up. They, they were getting ready to shoot. He goes, oh, my feet are fine now. My feet are fine now. So she took him to freedom, too. And um, John Pierre and Hester were friends with Lucretia Mott. And um, Hester helped uh, Lucretia Mott set up the female anti-slavery society. Uh, and John Pierre conducted um, some of the runaways uh, to Lucretia to help them get to Canada where they would be completely free. He died just before the Civil War. And one of his last acts was to sign a petition with Frederick Douglass urging free black men to sign up for the, for the U.S. colored troops. So unlike the Revolutionary War, where the troops were completely integrated, in the Civil War, the troops were segregated. And Lincoln didn't open up the ability of African Americans to join the Civil War effort until after it went on for so long, whites stopped joining, they started abandoning posts. So at that point, he realized he needed more troops, and they opened it up to three African Americans to join the US colored troops. These troops fought with such bravery. They were part of the last battles that took place that brought the end of the Civil War, including the Battle of the Crater in Petersburg. This is an area, if you tour, tour outside of Petersburg, where um, black Union soldiers um, fought Lee's troops, and they prevailed. I mean, it was a desperate situation. And in the end, one of the moments that makes me so proud of them is that these troops surrendered to U.S. colored troops. So I thought that was so appropriate way to end slavery. So this headstone is being consecrated two days before John Pierre Burr's 227th birthday. So that was part of the, the stress of getting this done because we wanted to have it done for his birthday. And as many of you know, today marks the 400th anniversary of the arrival of Africans into Virginia. And I've been researching that story for about six years after I found out that one of my father's maternal great-grandfathers uh, was born free in Virginia in 1847. And I wanted to know what was their lives like? What was it like to live free in, um, in a Southern society? And I reached the conclusion, which all of you will agree, is that slavery was wrong, wrong, wrong. And when you look at the history of how it developed in Virginia, you see that it developed as a legal construct. And they never, the Virginia legislators, never came out and said all Africans are slaves. And the reason why they couldn't is because from the very beginning, some of the Africans were treated as indentured servants. They owned property. They imported English servants to work for them. That's a part of our history that's buried. And I think it's important as we celebrate the 400th anniversary to remember that these were people who were who were living their lives with courage, with grace and dignity, and they were the example why slavery was wrong, 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 because there were elements from the very beginning that African Americans could take care of themselves, take care of them, their lives, and contribute to the American foundation. Slavery um, 
developed as a, a legal construct. And um, one of the things that was interesting, the 